Welcome to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy here in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Again, I am Father Chris Alar, one of the Marian priests of the Immaculate Conception, and we are continuing our Saturday morning series every Saturday at 11 o'clock. Some of you have probably been with us before, some of you are new, but we're continuing uh, the series of talks that I have put together on a DVD called Explaining the Faith. And this is a DVD um, collection of 13 of my favorite talks covering everything from uh, suffering, which we're going to talk about today. Today's topic is why would a good and loving God allow such suffering? Um, hope after suicide, Mary, divine mercy, confession, the Eucharist, the teaching mass. These are all things that I think are critical to understanding our faith. And this whole series on DVD is available as you saw on your screen on shopmercy.org or you can go to our webpage at thedivinemercy.org slash explaining the faith. And so all you hear today, this is kind of a preview of it, kind of a summary of it. But if you can't get the DVD, you can at least pick up, I think, a lot today. And um, we're going to show you at the end of the talk today, my subject matters or topics for the next several Saturdays. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Today is probably the most applicable topic of all which you saw on the title slide was why would a good and loving God allow such suffering? So as you see on the screen, this is a question. Why does God allow us to go through this, to suffer so much? Why? If he's merciful, if he's all good. Well, this is what we're going to explore today. All right. Surveys that they have done on many, many atheists or people who claim that they don't believe in God have stressed the fact that the main cause that people do not believe in God is just that. Why would he allow us to suffer like this? There can't be a merciful or a good God. In fact, there can't even be a God at all if he allows this kind of evil, unrest, suffering, and turmoil. In this age of what's going on right now between the coronavirus and the social unrest, I think you could say, wow, Father Chris, I'm going to stay with you this morning because I really want to try to understand this better. And I'm going to give you the church teaching. All right. Many religions, um, even the Jewish, believe that suffering is evil. What did you do? Remember Job in the book of Job? Uh, all his friends said, man, what the heck did you do? What sins did you commit to cause all of this um, misfortune to fall upon you? And so this is a common belief outside of our Catholic faith. Our Catholic faith is unique because the saints say that suffering has inestimable redemptive worth, that nothing else equals it. That's a powerful statement that if the suffering is that kind of power, let's find out why. Now, Jesus said to St. Faustina, quote, you will save more souls through prayer and suffering than will a missionary through all of his teachings and sermons. Boy, talk about a blow to a priest, right? Like me sitting up here trying to teach and preach. And our Lord comes in and tells St. Faustina that your sufferings are going to save way more than some priest like Father Chris sitting up there trying to teach and preach. I, I think that's why all of you watching this have more power than I do believe it or not, than an ordained priest because your sufferings have that much redemptive power. And we're going to show you why. You know, a demon, sometimes God makes demons tell the truth, right? And a demon once told John Vianney that 80,000 souls avoided hell due to his sufferings and prayers alone. This is amazing. Again, let's go back to St. Faustina. <clears throat> In one of the <clears throat> paragraphs of the diary, 1804, that I always quote, she said that Jesus told her that if angels were capable of envy, they would only envy man for two things. 
One is that they can receive Holy Communion, meaning they being man, us. So the angels would only envy us, mankind, for two reasons. One is that we can receive Holy Communion. Remember, they can't. They are spirit only. We are body, soul, composite. Well, anyway, the other reason is that we can suffer. And it's the angels who cannot suffer. You would think, gee, that's great. I want to be an angel. I wouldn't have to suffer. Well, actually, the angels envy us that we can suffer. Why? Because we most imitate Jesus. They want to be like Jesus. And yet, suffering is the way that we share and can be like Christ on the cross. I know that's so hard to believe right now. Just stay with me. Stay with me. And we're going to try to explain this. All right. A great Jesuit priest who um, I've quoted often named Father John Harden, God rest his soul, said, quote, It is when we offer our suffering the one thing most disagreeable to our human nature back to God, back to the creator, that it becomes a gift of inestimable value, drawing down from heaven, listen to this, drawing down from heaven more grace than any other action we can possibly make. Now, when I first read that, I said, come on, Father John, I used to really like you, but you're way off base on this one. Love is what draws down more from heaven, more grace than anything else, not suffering. And then I read the next line of his book. (laughs) It said, we love only to the degree that we are willing to suffer. So they are united. The defining moment, he said, of our redemption was not when our Lord preached or healed the sick. As you can see on the next slide, the defining moment was when love itself was nailed to a tree and drained of his blood. Love and suffering. In this way, love and suffering are inseparable. Jesus showed that that was the the importance of that statement. This is love and inseparable suffering. How important is that? Now, we can also look at right out of the Bible. No greater love hath a man than when he lays down his life for another, and that's what Jesus did. I like to say no greater love is there ever than when someone suffers and dies to save their very executioners? And that's what Jesus did. All right, let's go to the next slide. You see John Paul II there? This is a powerful, absolutely powerful example. He said, look at your slide on your screen. Each man in his suffering can also become a shearer in the redemptive suffering of Christ. Wow, this is amazing. Now, John Paul's apostolic letter, Salvavici Dolores, or the Christian meaning of human suffering, which he did back in 1984, covers this. I'm going to summarize the whole thing for you right now. I read it in seminary, and I'm going to summarize it for you in just a minute, in just a couple minutes. Christ, he said, sanctified suffering making it salvific, meaning it can give us salvation by his love. We, he said, can be partners in Christ's redemption. We can be, he said, many co-redeemers. Boy, that scares people, doesn't it? Wait a minute, Father, there's only one redeemer, that's Jesus Christ. Yes, But when he called us a co-redeemer, which scares every non-Catholic in the world to death, but it shouldn't, he points out that co, C-O, in Latin is cum, C-U-M, which means with, not equal to. We are not equal to Christ the Redeemer, but we are with him. And when we unite our sufferings of ourselves and our lives with him on the cross, we become, John Paul said, many co-redeemers by offering these sufferings. 
Again, I go back to St. Faustina, the diary, 1072, paragraph number 10, I'm sorry, paragraph 1032. Listen to this. I thirst, Jesus told St. Faustina. I desire the salvation of souls. Help me to save souls. Join your suffering. That's what a mini co-redeemer is, right? Join, how do you do this? Join your sufferings to my passion and offer them to the heavenly father for the salvation of sinners. I read that. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. She's not God. She's not a redeemer, but that's co-redeemer. That means that with Christ, we can unite with him on the cross and help save souls. This is how God set it up. How do we know this? Paul tells us in scripture, St. Faustina is dead on. Paul tells us in scripture, one of the most confusing scripture passages, he says, I must complete what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. Now, what possibly could be lacking from the sufferings of Christ? You know what is lacking? Our sufferings united to Christ. So when you get a headache, when you have a backache, or your children are absolutely driving you crazy, or your husband is driving you up the wall, whatever it might be, you can offer up those sufferings. Never let a single suffering go by, be it a headache or a backache or this pain from watching the news. Offer up these sufferings united with the cross of Christ and say, Lord, I give these to you or Mary, I place them in your hands and I ask that these sufferings be offered in atonement for my sins and the sins of the whole world and you can actually save souls. Yes, Christ saves the souls, but he uses the, the, the tools, he, he, he uses us as tools to help him in that endeavor. All right, let's finish here. Pope John Paul then explained that it is precisely in the church that the suffering of Christ is completed, just what Paul was talking about, since it is in the church that we unite our human sufferings with the sufferings of Christ. That's why when you come to every mass, just don't sit in the back smacking on your gum, come to mass you have the cross of christ in every church there's a crucifix with jesus nailed to the cross and you sit down and you reflect and you pray and you offer all of your sufferings and i can guarantee you if i sat down with every single one of you watching this broadcast today this live stream we could come up with some sufferings either mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you can offer those up united with Christ when you walk into this church. When you walk into mass, that's what you should be doing. Now, this also highlights the divine and the human nature of the church because the human nature, we're offering our sufferings, and the divine nature, Christ, you're offering to his cross, are united. This is why we have scandals, because the church is human and divine. In her divine nature, she won't fail. She teaches the truth. But in her human nature, we have some stupid acts that, that, that should never have happened. That doesn't mean the church isn't the truth. All right. John Paul II said, quote, this one blows me away. You want to, uh, you want to like I said, show this as a Catholic. This, this rises a lot of eyebrows. The saving work of Jesus is not finished. <gasps> Father, that's heretical. That's heretical. Well, I tell you, that's what John Paul II said. The saving work of Jesus is not finished. Quote, he needs us to cooperate. Now, technically he doesn't need anything, but this is how we set it up. He needs us to cooperate with his work of redemption and bring his mercy to this generation. This kind of partnership involves a sharing in his sufferings in order to share in his saving work of mercy. John Paul II said, this is the meaning of suffering. It is salvific, it is precious, don't waste it. You know, it breaks my heart 
Um, when I go to nursing homes, and unfortunately because of the coronavirus, I haven't been able to in a couple months, and I, my heart is uh, desiring to go back and go to the nursing homes. But it's always so sad when I see so many people there that are letting these sufferings be wasted. It's, it's so hard to see a soul, these precious, precious people that are, are, are in the last moments of their life and they're racked in physical pain or spiritual or emotional pain. And, 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 and I've been asked before, like, Father, what's the church teaching on assisted suicide? I'm nothing but a burden to my family. I'm a burden to the state. Staff. I'm a burden to society. I offer nothing. I do no good. And I'm thinking, whoa, time out. Do you realize that there's more power in the suffering you are going through right now than any atomic bomb in the world? You have more power in what you have to offer to Christ on that cross for the salvation of all your loved ones. Your children bother you because they're not going to church? Offer up that suffering. Your grandchildren bother you because they don't even come visit you? Offer it up for the salvation of your grandchildren. Don't let it be wasted, John Paul said. All right, the next slide. All right, you look after uh, the next slide up that we have up on the screen. And there's a picture of me, all right, sitting there. I, um, uh, well, let me start with the two people who are above me there. One is Marie Romagnano, uh, uh, registered RN, God bless her. Um, she's the reason in many ways I'm still alive because I call her the medical pit bull. She, um, when I had some heart problems, she wouldn't let the doctors rest until they found what it was and it saved my life. I started with blood clots. It started in my legs from flying. Um, those blood clots went up through my system into my lungs. Uh, I got pulmonary embolisms. Uh, thank the good Lord, they, they lodged off center a little bit so that it didn't kill me. But then um, the pain continued even after the procedure for that and they, I lost a big chunk of my left lung. And then they found that I had severe chest pain. They thought it was related to the lungs, it wasn't. They found out that I had 99% blockage in my main artery of my heart, which is coronary artery disease. Then I had to deal with that. Then they found um, cancerous tumor or um, polyps in my colon that they have cut out. So hopefully that's all contained. Then I got the worst kidney stone you can imagine. I mean, I could go on and on, but um, I won't. Why, why did I put this up there? All right. We need to accept and offer our suffering in union with the passion of Christ. I know that is easier said than done. I know some of you are looking at me and say, Father, that's easy you to say you have no idea what health problems I'm going through. Well, I can show you, as you saw on the screen, I've gone through a lot of health problems. Uh, I'm very susceptible and I got a lot of issues. Now, we have to trust though. That's why St. Faustina said, we most resemble Christ when we forgive, that's a subject of another topic, or a topic of another subject, and when we accept our suffering. Now, does that mean, Father, you're sitting here telling me, um, Father, I should be praying to God and saying to him, bring it on, Lord, bring me more. Father Chris said, give me more suffering, give me more pain. No. What did Jesus say in the garden? Jesus said, Father, let this cup pass me by, meaning the cup of suffering. Every day we should be praying, and I pray for all my, my brothers, my relatives, our benefactors, our friends, that the cup of suffering passes you by. But then what did Jesus say in the garden? But not my will be done, your will be done. And this is important. All right. If we do that, if we accept our suffering, this can remit, mean take, which means take away, the just punishment for our sins or even the sins of our loved ones. Yes. Very powerful. Redemptive suffering, meaning it can save salvation, does not gain the individual forgiveness of sins. You can only get that in confession. All right. If it's venial, you can get it in the mass, but mortal sins, they can only be forgiven in confession. Don't say that Father Chris said, I suffer a lot and therefore my sins are all forgiven. No, the sins have to be forgiven in confession. But once your sins are forgiven, 
did you know your sufferings can be offered up to take away the punishment that we are due for our sins? And I use the word punishment loosely. It's more loving discipline of our God. All right. So basically, after our sins are forgiven, our suffering can reduce that penalty for sin, a.k.a. purgatory. It can, if we offer up suffering, that's why I've known several great, incredible people. I think of Carl Eby of Monroe, Michigan, Tom Eby of Monroe, Michigan, family friends that suffered tremendously before they died. What little sins they had to atone for, I believe, were wiped away on this earth through their suffering. Or Father Greg Staub, an incredible oblate father um, out of Massachusetts here that passed away. His birthday was just the other day. This man was a suffering servant. He suffered tremendously before he died, an incredible priest. Again, I feel that that was what little tiny sins he may have had atoned for that. So those of us like myself who have more sins than those individuals, the more suffering that we can offer up to atone for those sins is actually a mercy of God. I know it sounds crazy, and I know you keep saying, Father, but you have no idea what I'm going through. You're absolutely right. When we get into things like losses of loved ones, death, or dying, it changes everything. And it's easy for me to say it's a lot harder to live, but we're going to get there, okay? Hang in there. All right, now... Redemptive suffering, as I said, then is actually mercy. Isn't that kind of a paradox? That's why I call Jesus our Lord of the paradox. Because we get punishment now instead of eternally. This is important. So this is, this is incredible to me. The worst cross of all is to have no cross at all. Did you hear that? The worst cross of all is to have no cross at all. That's why I used to admire all those people that appeared to have everything perfect, perfect health, perfect this, perfect that. Actually, as I learned more about God and the scriptures and Christ's teaching, it seemed to me a little bit more understandable that if God allows some crosses in my life, those are for my own benefit to be able to help atone for those sins that I've committed and, and all of us, right? All right, let's look at the next slide. How could a good God allow such suffering? You can see it right there. How could a good God allow such, so much suffering? This is now, let's go on. Suffering, I said, is redemptive, but there's more reasons why. I keep asking the same question, but I'm going to keep giving you more different answers. So we, we just talked about it's redemptive. All right, let's move on, Father. I got that point. Let's move on to the next one. Yes, it's redemptive, but there's more reasons. The Catechism in 1521 tells us that, yeah, suffering in part is a consequence of sin. I think a lot of that is what we see happening in the world right now. All this talk about we need justice and we need this and we need this, but is anybody saying that we should try to clean up our sin and try to bring God back into society? That's the best answer to all of this. The answer isn't more laws or regulations or forced apologies. What is, what is really going to make a difference or defunding police, what's really going to make a difference is saying, all right, we've been sinners. We've rejected God. We've pushed him out of society. Let's now try to change that. That is the reason a lot of us are suffering is not just maybe your own personal sins, but we're part of the body of Christ. So my sins hurt you, your sins hurt me. When we sin, we, we create a whole disruption to the harmony of God's universe. And so this is what's going on. Seeing these um, sins that result in these sufferings cause many to doubt God. And that's why God is allowing us to be tested, tested in our faith and our perseverance. As I said, this sin causes a disharmony to God's universe. And so we have a choice. Do we want to do virtue and put harmony back in God's universe? Or do we choose sin and try to get rid of this harmony that's in God's universe? This is a crazy question to even think of asking, but it's true based on what's going on. All right, next slide. You see a slide up there right now. I started my business in North Carolina one month before 9-11. And so you see there the pictures, the haunting pictures from those of you who can remember it uh, from 19 years ago was 9-11, the terrorist attacks in New York City. And that title says it all, doesn't it? Where is God? Where is God? All right. Now, 
We've all felt this way at one time or another. But another reason why God allows some things, now he doesn't want them, in God's ordained will, he did not want the bombing of the Trade Center. Please let me make that clear. Please don't send a letter saying, Father, you're saying that God wanted the terrorists to attack the center. No, he didn't. He gave us free will. And when God gave us free will, the greatest gift we have, he took a huge risk, a giant risk that we would turn away from him and hurt our neighbor. The perfect example is 9-11. So in God's ordained will, he didn't want the bombing. No, he doesn't want the coronavirus. He doesn't want a young child to die. But we can't argue the fact that some mysterious way, a way we don't understand, a way we can't fathom, he allows it. Now that doesn't mean he wants it. As I said to a brother yesterday, I said, it's kind of like a parent that loves their daughter and live next door. She doesn't want her daughter to move across the country so she won't see her grandchildren anymore. But she allows it because it's the best thing for that family. Maybe there's a better job out there, or a better uh, opportunity, or, or better schools, or better churches, whatever it might be. And so in God's ordained will, he doesn't want these things, but in his permissive will, he allows them. Why? Why, Father Chris? Because God wants to bring a greater good out of even these worst evils. Well, Father, what greater good could have come out of 9-11? All right, yes. Was it uh, 3,000 people lost their lives that day? Horrible, like 2,998 or something. Horrible, horrible, horrible. But believe it or not, as much as God did not want that, he brought a greater good out of it. You know what that greater good was? That following Sunday, remember 9-11 happened on a Tuesday. That following Sunday, the churches were absolutely packed. And some of the best parishioners I know at my old church down at St. Mark's Huntersville, North Carolina, were people who came back because the church on that day was packed and that's what brought them back. And they've been with the church ever since. 19 years ago, they're still good parishioners and they came back because of 9-11. I'm not saying that saying, God, give us another 9-11. Of course not. But when these free will choices are done, God can pick up the pieces, right? All right, let's look at the next slide. How do you explain something like this? This is very difficult. These are a rash of high school shootings. Remember, uh, we had so many shootings in the United States for the longest period of time. And the people began to ask the question again, where is God? This, this is another very difficult question to ask, right? And so look at that screen. Look at this. This is the students running out of the schools. Another high school shooting, right? All right. This all seems like a tremendous evil. But I always like to ask the question, and I'm going to ask it today, does evil really exist? Is it a real created thing? And surprisingly, the answer is no. Wait a minute, Father, what are you talking about, right? No, if it was real created thing, that would mean God created it. God can't create, believe it or not, something contrary to his nature. God is all goodness. He will not, cannot create evil. It goes against his very nature. Everything created is good. Wait a minute, what about Satan, Father? Satan was actually created good, right? He was the angel of light, the highest of the angels. He chose through his free will to fall, to be disobedient and turn away from God. And so people don't understand this. Um, it's what evil is, is actually a privation of the good. That means a lack of the good. So here's the point, everybody. When we, God, who is goodness itself, when we pull God out of our courts, out of our schools, out of our families, out of society, when you pull out God, who is goodness itself, what is left is a privation of the good. That is the definition of evil. Not that God created it, but because we took God out of it. 
That is what evil is. Um, this is the result. The, the school shootings are a perfect example. You know, when they had school in, uh, prayers in school, there was never a shooting in the United States of America when they used to have prayer in schools. And in 1963, they took prayer out, and everything has been downhill since then. Violent crimes have increased, unwedded pregnancies, um, abortions. Everything has gone up since they took prayer out of schools in 1963. And so we have the effect now of our schools that are, are barely held together now, our society, because when we keep taking God out of it, this is the result. That's what evil is, a lack of the good, and God is goodness. We pull him out. What's left is evil. You know, I've told the story before. I was going through the airport once, and I saw a young lady with a T-shirt, and um, it really caught my eye. And this young lady was probably in her mid-20s, an attractive young lady, and she has this shirt on that said, Columbine, Sandy Hook. You know, these are the school shootings. And then it said, God, quote, how can you let this happen in our schools? Question mark. And then below it, it said, God, quote, I'm not allowed in your schools. And I was like, wow. I mean, I wanted to take a picture of her, but I figured a priest following a girl around the, around the airport wouldn't have looked too good. But the, you get the point here. The point is that's what happens when we remove God. You know, um, in his permissive will, God allows us to make our own decisions. He'll never trump your free will. But when you do, there are consequences. This is what scares me every day. I don't want to be servile fear to the Lord, but a true fear of the Lord, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, should kick in on our consciences. That when we choose to do something wrong, there are consequences. It was once said that, as I said before, that God took the greatest risk of all in giving us our free will out of love so that we could love him. But it was a risk because then we could, as I said, turn against God away from, not against him maybe, but away from him and then against our neighbor and, and, and choose not to love him. But again, God wants to bring the greater good. Even when we do that, that's how awesome and, and infinitely loving God is. Even when we mess up and turn away from him, he gives us a chance to get a greater good out of it. This is what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. What, what, what mess up they did there, right, by, by the fall, but what greater good came out of it? God didn't waste a second. Soon as Adam and Eve fell in the garden, go to Genesis 3.15. What was, what was the greater good that came out of the fall of Adam and Eve? The promise of a savior and the gift of a mother. That's what came out. So as you can see, this is a powerful example of just yet another reason why God doesn't want suffering, but why he allows it. All right, let's go to the next slide. You see this picture? This is White Castle. Now, for some of you who are from Michigan or Chicago area, uh, like I am in the Midwest, you'll recognize that White Castle, right? That's a little hamburger joint that you have in the Midwest that had like quarter hamburgers and stuff like that. And... I wanted to give a pr uh, practical example of what I mean by God being able to bring a greater good out of even the worst suffering. And to tell you, there is no worse suffering than the death of someone we love. And so I want to tell this quick story because it gives a good example of that. There was uh, a mission that Father, now Father Allen and me did when he was a brother. And um, we were in Chicago area and we had done a talk at a parish and we hadn't eaten since lunch that day. And we did a whole mission into the evening. And then we had to drive an hour and a half back across the city of Chicago to get to our parish. Well, anyway, we hadn't eaten, so we're hungry. And in the middle of the night, it was about midnight, we see this white castle. And it was still open. The, the lobby was still open. So we pull into this white castle. And Father Allen and I walk in, and we get in line. And there's probably 50, 60, maybe even 70 people in this large lobby area. Cashiers are all going, people are mingling around and ordering their food, and all of a sudden, in walks this guy. And you've been there before. You see the guy that just has something in his face that shows he's angry, he's upset, he's hurt, he's not having a good day. And sure enough, 
we're there in our collars and this guy walks through the doors, heads down, and as soon as he looks up, he sees the two of us in our collars. Now I'm already a priest. And so he looks and he is angry and he starts coming right at us. Now all of a sudden in my mind, I'm starting to go through what's the church teaching on self-defense and all this kind of stuff. And he comes up to the two of us and he zeroes in on me. Now, now Father Allen is, uh, is a bigger guy. So I, I felt like throwing Father Allen in front, but uh, that was all right. He, he came at me and the guy took his two fingers and he jammed it in my throat, on my collar. And he says, you tell me how your God let my five-year-old niece die of leukemia. You tell me how your God let that happen. This is a good question. This is a valid and a justifiable question. This man was hurting. How could this happen? Now, I'm a freshly minted seminarian, right, out of seminary, and I start giving all the theology explanations that it's a result <clears throat> of the disharmony in God's universe, the result of original sin, and the consequence of sin, and he, that didn't work. He just got more angry, and he looked at me, and he says, she was five years old. She didn't have any sin. And I remember trying to justify it with all this theology, and he wasn't ready for that. God bless that man. And here comes Father Allen, and he just shoves me to the side. And the first thing he did is he looks at this guy and he says, Sir, what's your name? And I remember thinking, gee, I should have thought of that, <laughs> right? And by this time, everybody's looking, right? The whole restaurant came to a screeching halt dead silence. This was one moment of a lifetime that you may never get to evangelize in one minute to 70 probably people who've never walked into a church and you have one moment to reach them. Well, God chose Father Allen that night and Father Allen says, sir, do you believe in God? And the guy says, I don't know. I just don't know. He was hurting. This is valid. This is understandable. And Alan says, well, sir, I don't know you, but I can tell you this. Right now, there is a little girl sitting on the lap of Jesus up in heaven because you're right, sir. She's only five years old. She didn't have any sins and she's in heaven. This is church teaching. But right now, there's a little girl sitting on the lap of Jesus, and Harold, she is praying for you. Now, Harold, if I was a betting man, I would tell you that right now, those prayers are going to help you. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be to the day you die. But Harold, I don't even know you, but I am going to tell you that I strongly believe that those prayers are going to get you to turn back to God. And then, eventually, there will be two souls in heaven, the little girls and yours. Whereas otherwise, Harold, we don't know, only the mystery of God knows, but otherwise, if this tragic event wouldn't have happened, there might have been two souls lost. Now, does that mean that we should hope and that another little girl dies? Absolutely not. God didn't want this in his ordained will. He didn't want leukemia for this little girl. Sin and disease didn't exist in the garden until the fall. And now these things are a result of that sin. You see, Harold, she didn't die because of her sin. She died because of my sins. Our sins permeate the universe. And this is what's going on in our world today. But God wants to bring a greater good out of it. And the greater good is this little girl's in heaven. She's praying for you. Jesus hears those prayers. And I believe that Jesus is going to take those prayers and help you get to heaven. You see, Harold, that may sound crazy to believe right now. But God didn't want this. No, no, no. But he can bring a greater good out of it. He can pick up the pieces after we shatter the vase. And he can glue them back together. This is hard to understand, impossible 
if this was the only world, if this was the only world that existed and there was no afterlife, you were right. This would not be possible to understand. But because, and this story wouldn't make any sense otherwise, it only makes sense that based on there is something greater called heaven, the supernatural, the afterlife. If you don't have faith, this story would make no sense. Father, I don't believe this. This is crap. The, the, the death was a tragedy, and I hate God for it. See, without faith to understand that God's not causing the death, but he's just trying to pick up the pieces, we can't grasp that. God permits evil and sin so that we may know his mercy is greater than sin and death. Here's that story I just told as a perfect example. And you know what's funny? That man, after Father Allen talked to him, you could have heard a pin drop in that restaurant. Everybody was listening. And that man turned away and walked out and didn't even get his food. That's how impactful that moment was. So, as I said, God permits evil and sin so that we may know his mercy is greater than sin and death. This gives God more glory than if we never sinned in the first place. This is why the fall in the garden by St. Augustine is called, O oh, happy fault. That God actually made a greater good out of something as tragic as the fall of Adam and Eve. Before the fall, we had no sickness. We didn't get the coronavirus. We didn't, you know, have any... Uh, uh, diseases but after the fall God brought a greater good now yeah we have those little temporal sufferings not little they're big I understand that but now we share in the divine life of God we share in the divine life of God God brought a greater good than if that fall never happened I know that seems ironic that seems counterintuitive but this is what St. Augustine says oh happy fault powerful stuff the enemy will use it to cause us to despair we have to all go through these tests God wants to know is our faith with him the Lord wants to know will you trust him during suffering if we pass that test we will be perfected suffering is the best way to be perfected that's what purgatory is they're suffering so we're perfected and we're ready to go into heaven he will not give us more than we can handle. I know it doesn't seem like that. Oh, I know. I can tell you. I hear confessions. I, 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 I hear spiritual direction. I know it doesn't seem like that. Jesus will not give us more than we can handle, but we do have to share in the cross. Jesus never preached that we were going to be flawless in this life without a cross. <clears throat> Look at the next picture. The next picture is what we call these mega churches, right? And there are some good ones. I'm not, I'm not at all um, doubting that. There are some great pastors. There's some great people, beautiful uh, services, n n no issues there whatsoever. But I was flipping through TV one night looking for EWTN after a parish mission, and I came across one of the probably the most Protestant, or excuse me, um, prominent um, mega church, biggest church in the country type of person. And I stop just out of some curiosity and I heard this particular preacher say well we don't put God in a box you know he was definitely trying to get on the Catholic Church for our tabernacle and understanding of the the Eucharist and he says some religions like to put God in a box we don't do that all right okay I understand you don't understand John 6 verse 52 to 58 but that's all right let's let's keep going here but then what he said in this particular preacher said next really bothered me because he said and now i'm not saying this was just a one-time event i've heard the same preacher on sirius radio say this over and over and he said you love jesus you'll get that new car you love jesus you'll get that new house you love jesus you'll get that beautiful new wife I'm sorry, that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's called the gospel of prosperity, and it's dangerously heretical. Please don't fall for that gospel of falsehood. This is sweeping millions of Catholics away from our Catholic faith into these other religions that preach the gospel of prosperity. 
Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Read the next slide. Jesus said, There is no way to heaven except the way of the cross. I followed it first. You must learn that it is the shortest and surest way. All right, Father, that's easy for you to say. You have no idea what suffering I'm going through. I agree. I don't. I don't. And that's why I pray every day that God will alleviate the sufferings of all our Marian helpers. Please consider being a part of our family, the Association of Marian Helpers, micprayers.com. And you can join and see that we pray for you, that God heals you and blesses you and takes away this suffering. But if for some reason he allows it, we have to better understand it. Let's go to the next slide. This scroll here, St. Faustina wrote, I do not ask, Lord, that you take me down from the cross, but I implore you to give me the strength to remain steadfast upon it. Wow! That is the one that we should be listening to. That is the saint that tells us the power of the cross. Not that we should ask more of it, just that we can remain on what little part God wants to give us. All right? Now, look at the next slide. This is a quote by Bishop Fulton Sheen. Many people love quote business, or, um, uh, Fulton Sheen. This is an amazing quote. Sometimes the only way the good Lord can get into some hearts is to break them. Wow, isn't that a powerful statement? Why? Because this breaks our self-centeredness. A lot of times we are self-focused. You know, we shouldn't love God for his consolations. We shouldn't love God just because he's the God of consolations. We should not love just that. We should, I'm sorry, we should not, I said that wrong, let me <laughs> rephrase. We should love the God of consolations, not just the consolations of God. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. We should love the God of consolations, not just the consolations of God. Basically, God's not just Santa Claus. We love him not just for the gifts he can give us, because he can easily take those away. That's what happens when we suffer. Let's go to the next slide. These examples are in the Bible. These, these examples are in the Bible. How do we know? Look at this. Why do bad things happen to good people? All right, let's look at this. It's a reality. Good people have suffered. I'm sure many of you listening are examples. What about Abel in the Old Testament? He was killed by Cain. Job. Everything was wiped out. His children, his, his livestock, his home. He lost everything. What about the suffering of Joseph as he was sold into enslavement in Egypt by his own brothers? Talk about betrayal. Father, I've been so betrayed. My, uh, my niece said a negative thing about me at a graduation party. Yeah, this is terrible. But Joseph was sold by his own brothers into slavery. All right. What about Paul? He was stoned and whipped and beaten and chained and imprisoned. All for the glory of God, right? And what about Jesus himself? This is the perfect example. Now, again, I'm not trying to minimize our suffering. We have to understand that we want God to take it away. But a reason he allows it, let's keep going for these reasons, is he gives us a means to understand our need for God. This is powerful. It is a blessing to be like Jesus Christ. And one of the ways is suffering with him suffering servant is actually a vocation from god if you are severely suffering spiritually emotionally mentally physically it could be possible it could be ask god talk to your spiritual director it could be possible that you are a suffering servant is god asking you to be a suffering servant at least sharing a piece of his cross right? Pray on that. Blessed Dina Belanger. She said, quote, if we understood the worth of our crosses, 
we would be rendered speechless with happiness and joy upon receiving them. Now, I, I can't say I'm at that level of spirituality yet, but I'm trying. Did you hear that? If we understood the value of our crosses, we'd be speechless with happiness upon receiving these crosses. <laughs> Okay, if you're to that level, you're a little bit farther in the spiritual life than I am. Some I do thank God for, I do. But I'm not sure I'm, I'm totally elated and happy yet, but I'm working on it, right? Okay, each mass and each morning, we should offer up our sufferings along with the Son, Jesus, to God the Father. Remember, I told you the other day that when we come to mass, we are the spouse of Christ. Christ is the groom. Who's the bride, the church? Who's the church? We are. So we are the spouse of Christ as the church. And listen to the quote of St. Faustina from the diary. Jesus was suddenly standing before me, stripped of his clothes, his body completely covered with wounds, his eyes flooded with tears and blood, his face disfigured and covered with spittle. The Lord said, the bride that's us, must resemble her betrothed, that's him. I understood these words, St. Faustina said, to the very depth. There is no room for doubt here. My likeness to Jesus must be through suffering and humility. Whoa. Here's a perfect example of us seeing Christ suffering as the bride. We, as the bride, Jesus is saying we have to imitate that. Again, it doesn't mean we don't pray to take it away. But these are the reasons, all right? Now, next slide. Suffering can get us to heaven. That is what redemptive suffering means. Now, read this quote with me. Y'all love Padre Pio, right? This is a powerful quote of Padre Pio. Jesus said to me, how many times would, I have would you have abandoned me, my son, if I had not crucified you? Whoa. Beneath the cross, one learns love. And I do not give this to everyone, but only to those souls who are dearest to me. Gee, thanks, Jesus. <laughs> right? Y'all know the story of St. I think it was St. Teresa of Avila, right? Where, um, and, and please, I know some of you can correct me on this. I, I'm just going on an old memory here, but I think she was riding a horse or in a carriage or something, and she fell or, you know, um, fell into the ditch and got full of mud or hurt herself or something, and she stood up and she said, Jesus, why did you let this happen to me? And Jesus answered her, and he said, this is how I treat all of my friends. And Teresa of Avila said, no wonder you have so few of them. <laughs> so yes, don't be afraid to tell God, take this away. Jesus, take it away, please, I beg you. But if he doesn't, don't let the sufferings be wasted. Suffering is redemptive, as it said on that slide, if we unite it to the cross. So is your suffering too much? I bet it might be. I am not doubting that at all. I am not trying to claim that. But when it happens that you think your suffering is too much, contemplate his passion. Start thinking about what Jesus went through. Whenever I do that, all of a sudden, my big worries and pains and suffering seem to go away a little bit. Even something as severe as coronary artery disease and 99% blockage in my heart. When I contemplate Christ and his passion, that seems to go away. Now, before I show you the next slide, which is one of the most powerful slides, and before I show it to you, I want you to see, pray a little bit about what our sufferings are, then contemplate, as I said, the passion of Christ, and then you'll realize that your sufferings, and I'm not minimizing, I, I promise you, anybody's sufferings here. But I'm not sure any of us have ever suffered like this guy. Show the slide. I came across this. I was moved to tears when I first saw this. This is a man I believe in the Philippines. When I saw this, I actually said to the Lord, I'm sorry. 
for complaining like I have. Now, that doesn't mean God doesn't want us to complain. He wants to hear from you. But this gives a new perspective on what we go through compared to other people. I'm sure there are many of you suffering horrendously. But when I look at this guy, I'm like, I think this guy, if he accepts the mercy of God, is going straight to heaven. I can't imagine more suffering than what you see there. Now, this guy has every right, in my opinion, to complain, as we all do. But what I like to say to myself is, come on, Father Chris. Yeah, you got some sufferings, but don't broadcast it to the whole world. You know, Jesus didn't get up on the cross and say, hey, I don't feel the love here. No, he didn't do that. Sometimes I have a problem of doing that, saying, gee, do you know what I went through today? And this happened to me, and this happened to me. Sometimes we want to work on that a little bit. But do you know that saying one blessed be God in the moments of these little trials is greater than saying it 10,000 times when everything is good? So this is the power of suffering. We grow most in difficult times and we are pressed beyond our limit. Look at an athlete. An athlete is just, it's unbelievable. It's like the United States hockey team in 1980. There was no way that they could beat the mighty Soviet Union. They were pressed by their coach, pushed to the very limit. They were blown out in a preseason game against that same Russian team just a few weeks before the Olympics. Blasted, 10 to 3. And nobody gave them any hope in the world to beat the mighty Soviet hockey team. But Coach Herb Brooks pushed them beyond their limit. He caused them to suffer in pain. Not, not pain in that he was physically beating on them, no. But, but he pushed them beyond what they thought they were capable of doing. And that 1980 USA hockey team beat the mightiest hockey team in the world. And they were nothing but a ragtag bunch of college kids. Don't think that we can't be pushed beyond our limits like an athlete. And then to be able to grow. This is what God allows us to do in suffering. We can be like the good thief when we suffer and ask for God's mercy and help, or we can be like the bad thief and reject the cross. All right, I got just a couple slides to go. All right, what's this next slide here? Um, this is powerful. Read this quote. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, this is right from 2 Corinthians. The Father of compassion... And the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. You probably have read this before and it blew right by you. Think about this. Another reason, I'm giving you tons of them here today. Another reason why God may allow suffering is that you can help others after you've suffered the very same thing. What better help is there for a cancer patient than talking to a cancer survivor? Or tragically, what better help to a family that's lost someone to suicide than a mother talking to a mother that's been through it? That's why I love Sammy Wood, who's in my book, I'll show you at the end of the talk today, about uh, divine, God's divine mercy in Sammy and, um, and, and, and suicide. Sammy Wood showed how you can't get over it, but you can get through these sufferings. You can't get over them, but you can get through them. You know, to love means to sacrifice and deny ourselves. That is what suffering is. But sometimes again, God allows it so that you can help others. This is a priest. This seems, I think, um, many priests like me see this in the confessional. You know, a young man comes to me and says, Father, I'm really struggling with this. Um, and I can look at him and say, hey, I've been there. I'm a late vocation. I, um, I had a life before I became a priest. I had a home and a business and a, and a, and a, a fiancé. I was engaged to be married. I've, I know what you're going through. And man, I see these young men. They look at me. They're like, wow, you, you, you can understand. I think that's one of the reasons... God had me as a leader vocation because all those things I went through, including the sufferings, I can help as a priest in the confessional with the young people or not young, old too, who are struggling with that. All right, as we're wrapping it up here, this is powerful. Now, the next slide, here's a quote from St. Faustina. 
I love this quote. This comes from, and oh boy, I'm going to guess here. I think paragraph 57 in the diary. But listen to what St. Faustina says. When we suffer much, we have a great chance to show God that we love him. Yet another reason why God allows this. We have a chance to show God that we love him. But when we suffer little, we have less occasion to show God our love. And when we do not suffer at all, our love is then neither great nor pure. By the grace of God, we can attain a point where suffering will become a delight. Remember, I just read Blessed Dina Belanger. I'm like, oh man, help me get there, Lord. St. Faustina said the same thing. We can attain a point where suffering will become a delight to us. For love can work such things in pure souls. Wow. And so this is what we got to understand. If you're struggling, let's say you're like me and you still have these issues like impatience, okay? I'm impatient. Many of you are impatient because we don't love enough and we don't want to suffer. St. Faustina is giving us the remedy here. She's saying if we can get through that by offering up our suffering, suffering is the tool to teach you how to love. It's yet another reason why God allows it. Because through it, we can learn to love, which lasts eternally. This is powerful because we can either suffer temporally on this earth and enjoy our limited time here, which is just a blip, without any problems, or... And, and enjoy eternity, I should say. So let me rephrase this. I'm sorry. We can either have the choice to suffer on this earth for just a little time and enjoy all of eternity, or we can reject that suffering, choose to enjoy our temporal life here for but a blip, and suffer in all eternity. I don't know about you all, but that choice is easy for me. Give me a little suffering in this world, Cleanse me of my sins, Lord. Atone for my sins so that I can have uh, with you in, in paradise for all eternity rather than reject eternity so I can live and do whatever I want temporally these few years on earth. No, doesn't make any sense to me. I think it's very clear what we need to do there. All right, the last couple slides, my next slide here. What's going on there? You see a guy kind of waving his head behind the picture, this girl. Um, this is interesting. Because it's clear what's going on in that picture. That guy's annoying that girl, right? Well, do you know who you will be most grateful for at the time of your death, the saints tell us? Annoying people. <laughs> and we all have those. Even in religious life, our own brothers. I drive my brothers crazy, some of them, not all. And some of my brothers, not all, drive me crazy. But this is who the saints tell us we will be most grateful for at the moment of our death. Annoying people. Why? For without the crosses they provide, we would not be able to get to heaven. That's really interesting. Only at our judgment will we see how beneficial these annoying people were and all the trials they imposed upon us because they can help to sanctify us and the suffering they caused us. Remember, was it St. Therese or St. Faustina that that sister, the nun, fellow nun, drove her crazy because she made a clicking sound in the chapel and it drove her crazy? Well, that's an opportunity God said to grow in virtue and patience, right? Only crosses, I should say the crosses, imposed by others are part of God's plan for our salvation. So wives... Turn to your husbands and say, you know, I see you're annoying of me in a whole new light. <laughs> All right. Final couple slides. We are in the storms right now. I love this painting, right? This is a painting of uh, the Sea of Galilee and the big storm comes. We are in storms right now, but Jesus is with us just like he was in the boat. Jesus is with us, and he is in that boat. Now, here's what's interesting. Our suffering is like a storm. It comes out of nowhere and hits us, ready to swamp us. If we're not careful, we could even drown. But in every storm in the Bible, Jesus was present. Every time a storm arose in the Bible, Jesus was there. So 
he can remove that storm if we trust, or at least get us through it. What we have to do is trust. The problem isn't the storm. The problem is our lack of trust. And so this is what we want to see in God's message for us. All right. Slide. Next one is a scroll and it says, know that your body and soul will often be in the midst of fire. That is suffering, right? Although you will not feel my presence on some occasions, I will always be with you. Do not fear. Do you know that's written tw uh, 365 times in the Bible? One for every day. Do not fear. What were John Paul II's first words after becoming Pope? Do not fear. Be not afraid. All right. My grace will be with you. We just have to trust. We just have to trust. All right. Let's go on. One of my next favorite slides. St. Sebastian. Quote, when it is all over, you will not regret having suffered. Rather, you will regret having suffered so little and suffered that little so badly. <laughs> wow. This is very difficult. And you know what? I apologize. I skipped a slide. Let's go back. I probably messed up Brother Mark. Let's summarize here. Why does God allow suffering? Let's look at that screen. I think this is a beautiful summary. Everything I've said here today, to diminish the appeal of this physical, temporal life. This isn't what is important. Heaven is. Next, to make us like his son. Jesus suffered on the cross. We can be like him. To purify our faith in him. It's purified because what is tried like gold is in the fire. When God purifies us in the fire, like fire tried gold, we become purer. To teach us contentment and thankfulness. In other words, be happy with what God gives us, the good and the bad. That's the message of Job. To teach us prayerfulness and dependence. When do most people turn back to God? When they get deathly sick or a loved one gets deathly sick. They then realize, I can only depend on God to get better now. There's nobody else that can help me. No doctor, no nobody, no neighbor. I have to depend on God and his mercy. To perfect our inner man. That's the virtue. And to help us develop compassion. As I just said, that is one of the reasons that we, God allows us to suffer, is so that we can help others. All right. The last slide is a book that I put together with Brother Jason Lewis. And it's called, as you can see on your screen, After Suicide, There's Hope for Them and You. Now, I'm not talking about suicide today. That's actually going to be one of the things I mentioned next week. So please, next week, I invite all of you, especially those who have lost a loved one, to any type of loss, not just suicide, but especially suicide. Because next week's topic is going to be how we get through tragedy. This week, I explained why God allows it. Next week, I'm going to explain how to get through it. So if you've suffered the death of a loved one through suicide or any other means, please join us next Saturday at 11 o'clock. That's going to be my topic. But back to the book. This book does the same thing. The book talks about after suicide, there's hope for them, meaning the salvation of those who have died. People still think the church teaches you go to hell automatically. Well, there's more to the story there. We'll talk to you about it next week. We'll show you. And then there's hope for you left behind. We give the three spiritual principles of divine mercy to get you through any suffering and loss. Suicide is a good example, but not just suicide, any kind of loss. And so we ask, <clears throat> help us, Lord, get through these times. So this book, you can get a couple of places. Now on the screen, it says suicideandhope.com. That is one of the places that you can get this book. And also on that website, you can enter or memorialize your loved ones. There's no cost. You don't have to put your name, your email, nothing like that. You could put the name of your loved ones, either a first name, last name, nickname, initials, whatever you want. And I personally pray for each and every one 
of those people, and I say a mass every month for them. And so, so many people have gone there. You can get the book on that website, or if you want to make it easy, just go, as we've been saying, to shopmercy.com or shopmercy.org, and you can get the book as well. All right, let's finish now with officially the final slide. This is my upcoming Saturday talks that we hope you'll join us every Saturday um, that, uh, at 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, right here on the Facebook channel, Divine Mercy Official, or on our webpage, thedivinemercy.org. Let's go through these really quick. Uh, next week, next Saturday, I'll be talking about, as I said, divine mercy after suicide and any kind of tragedy. Today we talked about why God allows it. Next week we'll talk to you about how to get through it, how to understand it. Then, the following Saturday, June 27th, what is divine mercy? Now we're getting into the core. You don't want to miss this. We're going to show you how to get the graces that Jesus promised on Divine Mercy Sunday. If you're not preparing for those graces, you want to do them now. You want to start preparing. You want to understand it. We're going to explain it. Then the following Saturday, yes, July 4th, I know it's going to be a busy day, but it's in the morning. Fireworks aren't going out yet. We're going to show you the clip of what is, excuse me, give you the talk of what is divine mercy. And in it, I will have some video clips to show you. I can't wait. The next couple of weeks, you're going to see some video clips too. But we're going to talk about the image of divine mercy, the novena of divine mercy, the chaplet of divine mercy, and the hour of divine mercy. And the following week, July 11th, we'll talk about the Shroud of Turin and its connection to the image of divine mercy. Fascinating. And we're going to talk to you more. You'll know what you need to know about the Shroud and its connection to the image of divine mercy. Then we're going to talk about, oh boy, July 18th, a touchy, touchy subject. It's a very hard and difficult, but please bear with us. We're going to talk about the church scandal. Then following week, July 25th, we're going to talk about Fatima and the end times. Very applicable to what we are going through today. Then the following Saturday, August the 1st, we'll talk about angels and spiritual warfare. Also going on right now then on october excuse me um, august the 8th will be purgatory explaining the biblical foundations of purgatory and then finally um, this will probably change i apologize this is uh, uh, august excuse me august 15th but we have vows that day which will live stream you can join us but we'll have to move that talk probably to the following saturday we'll let you know a summary of the bible and how to read it so great topics coming up. So we are so grateful that you're with us. And I want to finish now by pointing out, if Brother Mark can put up there, if you enjoy these talks and you want to get them all in one place, um, at least the ones I've been doing up till now. Now, um, I'm going to be doing several new ones as we continue our Saturday series that are not on this DVD. But all the ones I've done, including today's and next week's up through um, that time period, are on my DVD called Explaining the Faith. Please, I invite you, share this DVD with your family, friends, and loved ones because it really can help. We can't love what we do not know. We cannot love what we don't know. So the better we know God and the church teaching, the better we can love God and the church. And so you can get this three DVD set uh, sent right to you. If you have an actual DVD player, you can visit shopmercy.org. Or if you say, Father, I don't even have a DVD player anymore, that's ancient, you can live stream it at the website on the screen, thedivinemercy.org slash explaining the faith. So thank you, everybody. I hope that you'll get that DVD, share it with your friends and family, but I'm creating new content that will keep going on these Saturdays, so we hope you'll join us again why would a good and loving God allow suffering? The short answer is he doesn't want it. He does not create evil. He gave us free will. Sometimes we choose the bad. We face the consequences. When we sin, we inject a poison into the universe. That a poison, when I sin, affects you. When you sin, it affects me. And that has to be undone through prayer and virtue. If it isn't, God will try to bring a greater good out of it. So God doesn't want it, but he allows it because he'll try to bring a greater good. And that greater good ultimately is our salvation. And when we offer up our suffering with the cross of Christ, as Paul says, 
to complete what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ, we can find salvation. All right, so God bless all of you. Thank you once again for joining us live here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. Please spread the word. We'll be back next Saturday, same time, same channel, Divine Mercy Official on Facebook and thedivinemercy.org slash, uh, excuse me, just the divinemercy.org webpage. So may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen, and may God be with you. Hello, everyone. If you're like us in the state of Massachusetts, where our governor has extended the non-essential business closure, you're going to be at home looking for things to do. There is probably no better time ever, before or after, than right now, than to get closer to God. You see, you cannot love what you do not know. So we want to help you to love God a little bit more by knowing Him. Instead of sitting at home on your couch watching reruns of Miami Vice like my cameraman Giuseppe. No, I don't. I, I think that we have an opportunity now more than ever to learn our faith. That is why I have produced a new video DVD series that can be used as small groups and parishes or right at home on your own couch that is called Explaining the Faith. These are my 13 favorite talks I've ever done that are regarding what we need to know about Jesus, Mary, confession, communion, why would a good and loving God allow suffering, and especially a walkthrough of the entire Mass from the start to the finish and everything that you need to know about it. Tell you what, here's a quick clip. In the church, it's just not come to stand, sit, and kneel, it's to engage in this most incredible mystery. This is what it is. The church, what makes the Catholic Church, the Church of Christ is the sacraments. The sacraments are just symbols. They do something. They're actual grace. Sacraments, if you remember your definition from catechism, are efficacious signs, meaning efficacious, they do something. They're not just symbols. They're efficacious signs of God's grace, instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is given to us. We have it so that Christ can enter into us and live in us. Now, if we don't receive him worthily, what happens? We lose that grace. So please consider, now is the time to get closer to God, and we're going to show you how. As I said, this DVD series has 13 talks that you'll be able to learn more and share your faith with everyone that you love to help get yourself and them to heaven. So please visit shopmercy.org or call 1-800-462-7426 to understand our faith better than ever before and to hear it explained in a way like never before. Thank you and God bless you.